Welcome to episode, no, mini episode number mini one. Episode. Is Welcome this episode to mini episode number one. 6.5, platform nine and three quarters. It's, episode yeah, this is episode six, six and three, and three quarters. quarters. It's actually like seven or eight and three quarters. I'm not sure oh, where yeah, we're releasing this, this come after. Out later yeah. after. Well, it's out when it's out. You can listen to it anytime. It really doesn't matter when you do listen to it, but it's it's being wedged. In the future, yeah. We're just shoving it in there where we can get it in. Yes. Welcome to Shove It In There Where We Can, episode (laughs) one. Welcome to the whatever fucking podcast this is. You don't want to mention that it's the Living Word Cult? No, I think that's great, but is it just going to be called the Living Word Cult podcast? No, no. Oh, what could it be? What could it be, Charity? You and I are both former members, Living Word, Fellowship. We're investigating the uh, the ins and outs of our experience. In and out podcast. <laughs> you can cut that part out. It's real casual. It guarantee is going to break down very quickly, which is <laughs> totally fine. It's, it's the Living Word Fellowship. It's the walk. Thought it was a church, turned out it was a cult. Oh, there's a good. That's it. That's what it is. That's it. I mean, I kind of love it. It's not bad. It's not bad. Oops, I'm in a cult. <laughs> Welcome. Nevertheless, here we go. What this is, what we're trying to do here is we've got a little a little episode um, that is we're going to be sharing some some stories that we've received. We've asked people to send us stories, thoughts. Um, Sometimes they show up in comments. Sometimes they show up in private messages. But we ideally would like you to send us your stories and thoughts about this to the email address below. Um, because sometimes you guys have some really great little micro stories that we want to share. And so we've culled through some of those and um, are sharing them here. Most of them are sparked by um, content from the other episodes and they spark memories or thoughts and they help expand a little bit of what was being said in those episodes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good feedback, good stuff, good interesting <laughs> yeah. things. Please send us more. Send us your stuff. We, this is... Uh... We want to share and we want you to share. So good. So let's just, so let's just jump into it. And Should get we get going. into it? What do you think? Like, yeah, let's get yeah, into let's, it. Let's do it. Do you want me to start or do you want to start? Yeah. Preface this one, which is, what is um, this comment coming from after which episode? This is, um, in reference to episode six, the JRS to be a charlatan episode. We had a, um, a former tape editor from the living word building in Los Angeles respond about this episode And they said, quote, I had a recovered memory while listening to your podcast about being in editing at TLW. I was tasked, as I'm sure many others were, with editing out every mention of John's first wife from tapes. When I finally asked why we were doing this, I was no longer invited to the tape room. We were fucking erasing evidence. (laughs) Wild. Um, And then they said, I specifically remember being asked to remove or edit out any mention of Martha and then having to ask blank the Head of the head of the tape editor department. Yeah, what to yeah. do with the rest of the sentence or story I found her name in. When I finally pressed her on why we were doing this, she didn't give me a straight answer, and then I was never invited back. Not that I was complaining, other than being shut out. For, other than being shut out from my friends that were allowed back. So again, don't question anything. Yes, it's really interesting. Just to expand on this a little bit. Now she doesn't. Our our source doesn't say this in here. The person that sent this message doesn't say this specifically in here, but the only reason I can think that they would be editing old tapes is for these republications of John's old, old tapes called hidden treasures. Mm -hmm. So these were old tapes that like they brought back into editing. And that's what I'm using a lot of, um, is some hidden treasures to find this stuff. And I've always known that like, I'm not getting the best stuff I know because they went through and processed it and edited it out anything yeah. that they thought would make the image of John or the living word look bad. They so whitewashed whether, it. whether this person was editing hidden, hidden treasures or not, that it validates something that I feel I've assumed for a long time that they would clean those things up. Yeah. Yeah. Suspish. Suspish. <laughs> what do you got? What do you got on your side? What? What's next? Bad Boy Boot Camp. Bad Boy Boot Camp. We, ha- we got a lot of... Um, Bad Boy Boot Camp was an interview with Titus. This was episode four of the podcast, and Titus was a former member who was dragged into um, the uh, boot camp in the early or the late 80s um, and was punished because he was 
called a bad boy. Um, the 80s, and early we, 90s. Yeah. And we, uh, we, uh, we got a lot of feedback on that. Very interesting conversation with him. One of the moms of a boy that was in the boot camp as well. And she reached out and said, I listened to the Titus podcast yesterday. I knew something happened to my son at Shiloh, but never sure what. He was so tight lipped and would never talk about it. As a parent, we were not asked permission if he could be part of boot camp. It was sold to us as a positive strength building for him. Um, she said, I don't think I could do a podcast, but there were so many wrongs done to my children, especially her oldest son. It's a heartache I live with. I hope someone can reach him and help. He won't hear it from me. Thank you for exposing this mind fuck. And then she goes on to say, I remember blank the the head the of guide, the boot camp, the head of the boot camp arriving fresh out of the army. And that he was, <clears throat> he was the one we were told would be training our boys. We did really understand what we didn't really understand what that meant, but we were impressed with him and what he accomplished in the army. I don't know how long my son lasted. It wasn't the whole summer. As I remember, as always, as parents, we were told what we needed to hear. Yeah. So that was an, some interesting insight as, as how it was sold to the parents. Yeah. And we specifically asked um, Titus in the interview if his parents were made aware of it and he wasn't sure what yeah. this is doing is it's it's helping us understand that, of course, the parents, to the extent that they were made aware of it, were duped on what it actually was yeah. and not fully informed. Exactly. They were. Yeah. It was branded as something different than what it was. Then we asked publicly on that episode on the podcast questions on that side. You can answer those questions if you're listening to Spotify. Um, we put up polls and asked kind of questions that we find interesting. We asked if anybody, what kind of experience they had at YASP and if they could, um, if they could share the story, their stories, YASP was the young adult summer program that ran from the early nineties all the way until, uh, pretty much 2018 when, when the whole thing shut down. So mm -hmm. some of those stories responses, um, were as follows. Okay. So one person responds, that they had to move cinder blocks from one side of the road to the other in the heat. Once we were done, they laughed and made us move them back where they were. This was <laughs> this was one of the activities when you were part of the young adult summer program at the Living Word Summer Camp in Shiloh. Was such um, a waste of time. <laughs> I remember working in the kitchen with my dorm mates, peeling millions of potatoes, prepping foods. I assisted making special meals for Gary and Marilyn with their personal assistant. Just being put to work in the, in the, um, you know, this is it. This is, this is what summer camp is. It's just working. Yeah, just work. Some of those were my peers, some of my best friends, but always a calculated mix of messages that we were loved yet not okay as we were either too much or not enough. Ooh, that was just so the general bad. messaging while they were there. Yeah, very true. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's somebody that lists out their uh, favorite jobs in order. So first worst job, first weeding worst. at the poop lagoon, worse than the oh. rose bushes. Oh my you God, <laughs> yes, I did that. It was like literal like shit and like maxi pads like floating around. But like, but it's also like, I mean, what does it matter if there are weeds surrounding yeah, the poop exactly. lagoon? <laughs> You want it to look pretty? Like, <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, the poop lagoon. The a poop lagoon is like a. It's a. It's where all the the. Do you flush the toilet and whoop, it just goes into this lagoon that's supposed to like yeah. naturally filter and everything. Big places like Shiloh had that. Literally. Gross. Okay. The second worst. <laughs> second worst job. Cleaning the grout with a toothbrush and harsh chemicals. So you know, kind of like military style. Picture, um, you know, Forrest Gump. Uh, third worst job, cutting bug infested rotten wood with a tractor attachment. I don't even know what that means. What is a tractor attachment? Like, are you like lifting a. I don't know. I don't know. Either way, know it's all I just manual, <laughs> manual labor. <laughs> Wouldn't it have been cool? Like if, if instead of doing all those useless things, I mean, besides making food, you know, you got to eat, but. 
Like if they wanted to teach kids work ethic or something like that, do something like Habitat for Humanity or like go help the community, go build stuff that is useful, like not spend your days in yeah. the hot sun moving cinder blocks from one side of the road to the other. Yeah, exactly. Oh my God, what a waste. Or weeding the poop lagoon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, so episode five was an interview with a um, a former student of the school who was not a part of the church. Um, after we recorded and released that episode, this was Bo Brown. He reached out to us and said that he um, more memories and things were coming in. And more importantly, um what he said was he was talking with his wife and after his wife listened to it, she noted um, something really interesting. And this is what he said. He said to us for us to share. He said, she pointed out something that was almost like an epiphany moment for me. I've always said all my relationships have been so awkward and I've been scared to do anything or be physical. It's something I've struggled with. It's totally because of my first relationship being watched at all times under a microscope at home, at school, and on dates. I feel like it almost conditioned me to be afraid to even go in for a first kiss. I struggle with that on multiple relationships, even with my wife. Yeah. And that he's referring to how, again, he wasn't a member of the church, but he tried to date somebody who was a member of the church and he was dragged into this interrogation meeting with shepherds and they were questioning him and they, every little thing, every time something happened in their relationships, it was another shepherds meeting and he's being dragged into all of this stuff that he's just trying to be a teenager and date. But the person he was dating happened to be in the church. So yeah. even though he wasn't under the control of the church, he got pulled into it. And he's saying here that something that even his wife recognized years later that he is having struggles with his relationships and the way that he behaves because of that conditioning early on. It's something that I fully understand and I've struggled with my entire life, too, in many of the things in my relationships. And I had barely even dated in the church and just the little bit that I was um that I had an interaction with the shepherds and them trying to control me and the shame that they put on, um, on, on me just trying to exist in the world is something that has stuck with me and has taken me years to even figure out that it's connected to that, yeah. you know, before you start to even like put those things together. And I think there was this general, um, and I don't know, I'm not saying that like Bo like felt this specifically, but there was, I think we've heard a lot from women, you know, girls turn it off, which we actually haven't even covered on this podcast, but we should do that someday. Scrap it. Uh, it's going to be a good one. You know, one. we've had, yeah, exactly. There's like, there's been a lot of shame, you know, it, that's been talked about with women. We've even seen with Titus and with Bo, these things come up for men. And something that I experienced and saw was just the constant um, conditioning from the leadership telling us in a specific way that like men are sex craze maniacs and like you need to control yourself and you need to like these like, like you know, the shame, like feeling you. behind it. And like, I never even felt like that. You know, like I, if I was thinking about the way that I felt as like a teenager, that's not the way that I felt and that's not mm -hmm. what I was thinking. But because that was put on me, the little bit of like desire to have a romantic relationship was like, Oh, bad. Shouldn't do that. Yeah. Shouldn't think yeah. that way, you know, and those kind of things, these lasting effects that go on into everything later because you're filtering your life through these early experiences. Yeah. They put that shame lens on you, on all of mm -hmm. us. Cause there was so much of that, just even not even, of course it was huge shame associated with sexuality. And like, like Bo talks about that he, him and the girl that he was trying to date, like maybe they got kissing, got caught kissing or something. And it was like this whole big deal. Um, there was a lot of that with us. Like, yeah. and the, the rhetoric was you're bad. If you do it, you're bad. If you think about it, you're bad. Even mm -hmm. if you want a relationship, that was some of the messaging that came through. 
I felt as well, where it's like you're you're somehow lesser if you even want to date. <laughs> there was some of that messaging early on, like I I got, and I I know others did too, as if that was so so much less of a um. It should be so much less important than like what you're doing mm-hmm. for the church or God or whatever. I don't know, but yeah. yeah, that makes me sad. I'm glad that that came up because there's a lot of talk around the women in the church, and it was very misogynistic, and we got a lot of. <clears throat> you know, our own conditioning from that, like girls, the girls turn it off stuff. But I think it's important to address how the men were affected by it too. And to be mm-hmm. lumped in with that, that generalization of all, you're all just sex crazed perverts. Yeah. And <laughs> it's, it's not, not fair. Yeah, it's not fair. It's really not fair. I, I also, I think one of the things I think is most interesting or very relatable from this comment from Bo is that his wife was the one that noticed it and spoke up when she heard this because I experienced that same thing with with former relationships they recognize that they're like you know you're weird basically you know (laughs) (laughs) not 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 in that way but like it's that thing it's like you recognize like this isn't normal and you're behaving and like yeah yeah, there's a hang up here um we also received another another message that's along the same lines from somebody who was listening to the podcast and um, shared this story. They, this was a former member of the church. Um, this is from somebody. They said, at 17 in the church, I was almost kicked out because of lust, because I had lustful thoughts about, quite honestly, a stunning hot gal, stunningly hot gal. Never touched her, never even held her hand, thoughts only. The pastor and elders decided that I and two others, all teens, were part of a triad, a source of witchcraft in the church, and we were taken aside one by one and yelled at in the church kitchen. Okay, these men of God, these guys who have special anointing, tell me not only is sex bad, but even the thought of sex is bad. Tell that to a teen. That kind of thing screws with your head. Sometimes I'll tell my story about this 40 plus years of trying never being good enough. Mm -hmm. And that is like, it is, yeah, that's from a man. And he, he's saying the same thing. It's just amazing to me that they say like a teenager is like thinking about sex and it's a triad and source of witchcraft. It's just so wrong. Like it's so wrong. And it's to take it. It's always this extreme. It's like, okay, biology is normal. No, 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 no. That's not what this is. <laughs> this is a triad, a source of witchcraft in the church. Like, just planting I talk those about, yeah. ideas in someone's head. They're going to, obviously, at that age especially, take that with them the rest of their lives. Every time they have, like, a sexual thought or desire, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, I'm bad. I'm horrible. I'm, I should be ashamed. That's mm-hmm. just cruel. I know religion at large is, like, very much that way. Um but I don't know if it's as specifically messaged as it was in the call. It just felt very, because we had these relationships with the higher up people, like our designated relationships or whatever, that were like in our face telling us these things rather mm-hmm. than it just being spoken from the, the pulpit. There was that, but it's then it's directed at you personally, yeah. one-on-one, and you're like, oh, I'm definitely bad. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, that makes sense because that's that's the way that this thing, I mean, I, th- I see this pattern over and over again in a million ways is you have the pulpit, which is like the propaganda and the the like thing. It's like really broad and it, you can take it as one way sitting in the audience, you kind of get a certain level of that. It's like, this is the high level thinking of this thing. It's like, you're this way, whatever the word is for that week. But then when it comes down to the specifics where they're dragging you off into the room and they're applying the word, the word to your current situation is where things get like really personal and really, you know, that that hits you a lot harder, Mm -hmm. I think. And they use the the word as the excuse to say that to you. Yeah. I remember I told you recently about when when we got our marriage check out when I was getting engaged and the pastor sat us down and was like, well, we've decided you can go ahead and get engaged. Like charity, we know all you've ever cared about is finding a husband. Like, look how many careers you've given up for some guy. And I was like, like really being like putting me down. And I was like, I've never had a career. (laughs) That was the first thing I thought of. Like I've never had a career, but oh, and it's like, I'm really less than because I wanted to find 
a mate. Yeah. How yeah. stupid of me. <laughs> exactly. It's like really dumb. Why is it that like in these things, it's just like the first thing is let's let's break this person down and tell you how big of a piece of shit you are before then <laughs> telling you if you're allowed to like get married or get engaged yeah. or date somebody or whatever. Takes it's all like the joy out to, of it. Yeah. Yeah. Like, why not go and be like, oh, this is a really exciting time. You guys are doing something. I'm so happy. You know, we know you've wanted to get married for a long time. So great. This is I'm so happy that you found the right person. No, it's like you're a piece of shit. You're settling. You know, you've given up so many. You know, it's like whatever. They're like saying all this, like putting all this like bullshit on onto it to break, break you down first. Yeah. Instead of support yeah. you. Yeah. Always. That's their M.O. That's their M.O. OK. What else we got? <laughs> We could go on with that forever. So it was a whole episode there, baby. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole episode there. Okay, this is a fun one. This is from. Um, we just thought this was an interesting. We had a poll up uh, on the podcast to see. Um, the question was: This is based off of episode three, "A Cult Exposed," about Shalom's letters, and we said, "Were Shalom's letters the catalyst to you leaving the cult?" And this is obviously for former members to get that information and. We had split right down the middle between yes and no, 40% yes, 40% no, and then 17.6% it's complicated, which I just thought was interesting to t statistics for those of you that are interested. I kind of thought the numbers would be skewed a different way, but also this is a sampling from our listeners and blah, 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 blah. So whatever. Yeah, there are polls at the bottom of all the Spotify podcasts, yeah. so if you ever want to participate there. Please do. Have at it. Have at it. Um, okay. Okay. So then let's, let's listen to this one. This is interesting. Okay. These, this is from a, a listener who emailed us at the, uh, the address we provide in the link below. They said, thank you guys for everything you're doing. I wasn't in or adjacent to the cult, but I know someone who was, it really did a number on her and listening to and watching your stuff has helped me to better support her as she's navigating the mountains and mountains of bullshit. I'm so curious about everything that happened. She's shared some of it, and I don't want to ask a lot of questions because I don't want to trip over something she's not ready to talk about. You guys have provided so much background info in a fun, entertaining way. Keep up the good, the great work. I, I, I feel like we've also heard from other people who have said something similar about family members and friends who they've known were traumatized by the cult, but they just didn't understand why, because the person doesn't want to talk about it or whatever. And then they've heard these stories that everybody's sharing um, on the podcast or some of the stuff that we're, we're talking about on here. And they've been able to have a better understanding and be able to support them better because yeah. they understand. I think that's so amazing. It's one of those things that like, you know, we didn't think would, you know, be a part of this or a result of this. And it's just really cool to hear that. Um, it shows, I think what a lot of, you know, what we're seeing is like when we share these stories, it helps so many people heal, you know, just sharing the stories, just knowing that, like other people yeah. have had these experiences and getting the details about stuff. It helps you, you know, I know that's what it does for me is it helps me feel better. Like when I hear these stories and when I see this stuff, it's like validates those feelings and, Absolutely. That are inside. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, it would be, it would have been nice to have uh, something something like this in a little package all these years where I could be trying to explain to somebody that was never in it. Well, here's why I'm super fucked off. <laughs> here's a podcast that explains all yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, maybe we should do an episode that's just 20 minutes long that's like and here's why everybody that's a part of the living world is fucked up in some, to some degree. Start from the top, go to the bottom. <laughs> it's just like It'll help you have compassion <laughs> for us so we're just That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Got okay. podcast kitty here. Podcast kitty. We've got some. Uh, we've got some comments about about how your kitty cat is a. Uh... <laughs> she just rubbed her face on the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have something to say? Okay. Oh my. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. Between Milo barking and her. <laughs> <laughs> Luna. Oh god. There she goes. Okay. Do you want? Do you want to read the what last? What is this one, one about? Read this one. Mm -hmm. This is another story that we received um, at the email um, link below for the email. Uh, Hi, I was raised in the church. My parents joined the Southgate Church in 68 or 69. They were married 
at the church by John Robert Stevens. They moved to Fresno and went to the church there around 1972. My sister went to San Diego, to the San Diego school in 1981, and my parents tried and failed to send me to Centers of Learning in 1983. I was at John Robert Stevens' viewing when he passed, which was the viewing that happened, I believe, at the Blix house is what it sounds like. That's what the viewing would be. The and viewing. I watched Gary and Marilyn get married. I was a part of the first YASP summer camp. I left in 1994, and my parents are, were still in the church when the abuse story came out in 2018. They left but joined the one in San Diego that focuses strictly on John's teachings. Due to the trauma of growing up in the church, leaving and having a narcissistic family, I now have non-epileptic seizures. It's like the gift that keeps on giving. Thank you for doing this podcast. Sometimes it feels like I dreamt the whole thing and I remember things wrong. Yeah. Mm. yeah That's what that, you were saying about it being validating for people. It's very validating to just hear other people share their stories. And that's, I think, a lot of the reason why we do the interviews the way that we do the interviews um, and, and allow people to like kind of have the platform and talk about it from their perspective because it, we then get to see, you know, is this validating the way that other people felt, you know? Yeah. I, I will say there is an interesting line in here that I didn't catch before when we were reading this. After the abuse stories came out, they left, these parents, they left but joined the church in San Diego that focuses strictly on John's teachings. I didn't know that there is a group in San Diego that focuses strictly mm -hmm. on John's teachings. Um, if that's not true or is true, please send us the email. <laughs> if you can verify or not verify that, um, because I know I've heard, you know, rumors of these kinds of things floating around out there of people forming little groups that are focusing, you know, we still follow Gary or we still follow John's teachings, just like these little yeah. micro. It's like team Gary or team yeah. JRS <laughs> exactly. or team fuck it all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'd love to, love to hear if anybody actually knows and can verify that. I thought okay, I wanted another... to point out too, how she oh. says though, that like she, she suffers from non-epileptic seizures. It's, I hear that from a lot of people, um, who have had physical issues, health issues because of all the the stress and trauma and, you know, years mm -hmm. under that kind of stress. It's, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a hard, sad. it's a, it's a really hard thing to, um, what, I mean, to find, to know that like your physiological or physical ailments are connected to trauma. It's, that's a, mm -hmm. that's a really hard, I mean, a lot of people like they feel that and, um, and if you can identify and connect it, like maybe there's a way to, but I've even like in small, small ways, you know, had to under, had to learn what stress was and realize yeah. that stress is a real thing. And it was like affecting me physically. And mm -hmm. I just assumed like, no, I'm not under stress. Like, I don't, I don't work in a, you know, like an environment that like actually is real. But nope, I was under stress and yeah. <laughs> that was causing physical problems with me. Mm -hmm. And it's so yeah. interesting. Like, I think people that are dealing with that, a lot of health issues and stuff because of trauma, like this person mm -hmm. talks about. Yeah. The nervous system just kind of goes, well, yeah. can't take yeah. any more. Very interesting. Yeah. This next uh, story comes from somebody who emailed us. Um, what was it titled charity from the outside uh, looking an in outside an outside or sorry, from the outside. Yeah. So it's titled from the outside. And this is somebody who sent us an email, of their story. They found the podcast and were listening to it. This is somebody that was not a part of the living word at all. And they say that, um, they lived in, um, Cedar Rapids, which is a medium sized town. I don't know anything about it really. And the, the, the airports there in Iowa. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a bigger like city. And, um, they decided to move to a more rural area and they chose Riverside, Riverside. which is just mm -hmm. outside of Kelowna. Um, it's in that same area. And Kelowna is where the Shiloh cult compound was for mm -hmm. all those years. And it was hidden in the, you know, back in there a little bit. And so, this person 
moved here and started in to get involved. Yeah, in 2010. And um, we're going to pick up their email um, when they decide to go golfing one day. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so he says, so we golfed a few times at the the Kelowna golf course. Um, and as you approach hole four, you notice a completely out of place water tower in the not so far distance. That is what struck my initial curiosity. Why is there a water tower in BFE, not even small town, <laughs> Iowa? I recall slowly driving by the compound for the first time. I was blown away by the size. Without knowing anything else about what Shiloh or the Living Word represented, my first thoughts were, why the hell is there a cult by Kelowna, Iowa, and why the hell don't I know anything about this place? I believe I did go to the 4th of July fireworks one time. It was a very good show. Don't tell Rick. <laughs> I say this was with I say this with experience in being a part of assisting with other semi-professional fireworks shows myself. Um Anyways, he goes on to say, after this, I recall any time I was near this compound and had any free time, I would slowly drive in. Sometimes I would park in the huge empty lot and just see what happened. I love this guy. <laughs> if anyone happened to even look at me suspiciously, I would immediately acknowledge their suspicion by starting my car and take off, perhaps rapidly, depending on my mood. <laughs> this is so great. You can see that. It's just like one person comes out and you're <laughs> driving. <laughs> I can only imagine what, like, security at Shiloh was thinking. Yeah, exactly. If nothing else, I figured this would push their buttons. Probably did. Probably I believe did. one time a vehicle even gave chase. Wow, <laughs> that's wild. I'm not sure I ever got out of the car. I almost always have a fishing pole in my car, as I'd consider myself a pretty avid fisherman. I was always very tempted to just start fishing in the large pond, but I'm not going to lie. Despite knowing nothing about this place or the organization it represented, it screamed cult to my spidey senses. <laughs> Your spidey senses were right, buddy. <laughs> All right. He goes, I can't say I really dwelled on these senses, though. I guess I'm an unspectacularly normal guy. Even to this day, I'm too busy with my family work and silly hobbies to give such things that much time or attention. When I heard the news about the place dissolving and them working with the city of Kelowna to liquidate this facility, I was not shocked. It was more like, sheesh, I knew that place was straight up evil. For no reason other than being overly busy, I haven't golfed at Kelowna or driven by the new burned and flattened compound in a few years now. Hearing your stories makes me wish I had ventured up into the facility after it was shuttered to investigate even more. I'm not even sure why I felt compelled to send this email. I suppose this is my odd way of showing appreciation for sharing your story. Please keep bringing the information forward. I am a fan and you've got my interest and support despite, despite me just going off a hunch. Please let me know as a semi-local if there's anything I can do to assist your efforts. I wish you all the best. I think That's it's fun. so funny. It's such a funny experience, this person. I'm sure there were like more than just him curious and like oh, yeah. knowing about this like this cult up on a hill, you know, like, oh, don't drive by, by the old Shiloh <laughs> compound, you know. It really was a creepy looking place if like, you didn't know. Oh, man. Oh, uh, yeah. It is, it is kind of funny because it is like in the middle of nowhere, this like huge compound, this like big, it's really pushed back from like, there's the main highway then there's a road mm -hmm. that looks like a little neighborhood. And then when you get to the to the Shiloh Drive, it's way up this way drive. Up. I mean, nothing could be cold here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you don't even really know, cool. but like most of the properties that you're driving around are all owned by, you know, the leadership or like, like the other Would side was Maryland the Farms. You keep going around, you know, all of it. Like, yeah, it was a lot of property there, but, um, I'm <laughs> driving up there and seeing somebody hitting the gas and speeding away. Is a I know. One. I feel like I heard stories, like when I lived at Shiloh, of people being like, someone was up suspicious mm -hmm. up here. Maybe yeah. it was that guy. No, I wasn't yeah. there in 2010, though. <laughs> well, that probably did happen a few times. Anyways, we love these stories and these little insights. If you have memories, please ideally send them in the email. Um, it's so easy for stuff to get lost in the comments and direct messages and things like that. So, um, yeah. yeah, please, please keep sending us, uh, thoughts and memories and your stories as much detail as you can remember, um, is always really great. Yeah. Yeah. We appreciate all the feedback we get and, um, and I know that it's also can be triggering listening to this stuff for former members and it brings up a lot. It brings up a lot, a lot. It brings up a lot for us doing it. Um, there's just yeah. so many layers and 
just want to encourage everyone to keep keep working through it, keep getting healthy and know that mm -hmm. um there's a way through it. I really I really believe there is. So keep on trucking. I made, <laughs> I made up that too. It was like something grateful deadish, but then I forgot the tune. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> always drop something at the end. Always. Yeah, that's how we do it. That's how we know we're getting out of here. It's let's cue the music when Charity knocks something over. She just starts flailing her hands and. Ugh. Thank you for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube. Send us your emails at the uh, address in the show notes below. We'd love to hear from you. Take it easy and don't join a cult.